Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duart. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday, the leading change episode this week with Kaisa Martiskainen. Hey, Kaisa, welcome back. Hey, Vasco. Thanks for having me back. So Wednesday is, of course, the change leadership episode. We want to dive into a story of change and uh, we want to, you know, walk us through that story step by step as it happened. But we also want to know uh, for each of the critical steps in that story, what were the tools, the tips, the tricks, the techniques you learned back then that you still apply in other change projects or change processes these days? Sure. So. I have a story of when I first joined a team that was um, a a big team that that had inside that team people who were doing several different types of work. So inside that team, there was a development team and there was also another team that whose work was more operational. So they were dealing with analytics and things like that. So when I first joined the team, um, I noticed that they were working in Scrum and I joined their meetings. I attended their meetings for, for a couple of sprints. And already at that point, I was hearing some some grumblings about how how their meetings were just super long. And people were quite unhappy about that. And and that translated to people being quite unhappy about doing Scrum. So so some people already had this feeling like, yeah, maybe, maybe this is not this is not working for us. And um so when I was myself sitting in those meetings that were they were honestly they were a bit too long for considering how many how many people were actively talking in these meetings so i first thing i noticed immediately was that there was a big team in the meetings but there were a lot of people who didn't say anything during those meetings uh so i was still in the process of observing what was what was going on and then i started noticing that the majority the majority of the people who were actually talking and had uh, had things in the sprint and who were demoing them, they were the development team, which which makes sense because I mean Scrum mainly makes sense if there are some kind of development tasks or development work being done. And I noticed that the people who were mer- working more on the operations side, they were just in the meetings, mainly observing, sometimes talking about their their monthly tasks or monthly reports. Um, but I noticed that the operation side of the team was not fully utilized in, in those meetings. Um, so how, how did you notice that? Was it there. that they had nothing to talk about in those meetings or was it that they were kind of waiting to be given work, but were not like, uh, uh, how did you notice that uh, the, they were not f- fully utilized? Um, well, I noticed, I mean, they had, they had their work, but just being there in the meetings, it was, it was pretty clear that their work was not something that was a good fit with two week sprints. So for example, they had these monthly, monthly tasks, like monthly reports to churn out or some other kind of maintenance things. That was the same task every month um and so in the in the sprint reviews or actually in the sprint plannings they would say well i have this coming up in the next two weeks but then in the sprint planning they said well it's actually it's only due next week so i don't i don't have anything to show so to me it was clear that there were at least two different types of work that were crammed into these sprints and the other types of the operational work didn't really belong there because the operational tasks would just stay in the sprint backlog, not being finished because maybe the time frame was not correct. 
um, or or something else. Or, or they and, or it and also took more I than a that, sprint to complete, right? That's also a possibility. Right, exactly, and and also they they were when you have some kind of a predefined task that doesn't change from month to month, then there's there's not really there's not much planning that you that you have to do because there aren't any unknowns in that case like you know you're you're going to get this report out every month and it's more or less the same so um so then i started talking to the team members and asking what they how they felt like their scrum was uh, going how how did they feel about things in general and from the developers as well as the operations people they kept on saying the meetings are too long and they feel they feel they so feel that was the symptom and... right but uh, as you talk to them you started to understand that it wasn't really about the meeting so as you dig uh, as you dug a little bit further what what came out as the real problem that the team was struggling with Right. So the so the operations side of the team was saying that we don't we, we feel useless in these meetings because we listen to developers talking about their work, planning their work. And then most of the time, what we have to show in the sprint review is just that we worked on some things. And, and other things we we couldn't finish them. So so they were feeling like they were they were making the sprint uh, result worse in a way by having their same tasks in the sprint backlog month month after month. And and they already clearly told me, they said, I don't think we should we should be working in these sprints with the development team. Like they already they already knew the answer. And then I actually found out that sometime before they had had their own separate Kanban board for their work. And at some point, the upper management had decided that actually everybody should start working together in these sprints instead. So they were, the operations people were telling me like, actually things were great before, but as soon as we had to, had to, had to join the development team, this is what's, this is what's happening. We're, we're not happy. We are we feel like we're wasting a lot of time being in these meetings where we have nothing to contribute. And, um, and it's also looking like we're not producing anything just because so we how don't did always you, necessarily how did have you something help to them show. Then? Cause I, I imagine that, that there was a lot of frustration in, in, in that part of the team, right? Like being in the meetings and not feeling useful and in perhaps, you know, even what, with what you just said, that kind of being pushed into scrum, when they've previously had mm -hmm. a, a, an approach that worked for them. Uh, how did you help them? Like what, what were your steps to, to kind of try to unlock this, this problem? Mm -hmm. uh, so my first step, I mean, after obviously my first step was to, to talk to these people. I put out some surveys that went to the whole team and I then tried to analyze, analyze the answer. So, I mean, the answer was, was pl pretty clear. Uh, they didn't like this way of working. They thought they would work better on their own separate board. That was that was Kanban style, so they could just put their tasks there and uh, and work work on them um, when it was uh, when it was a good time for them, and not necessarily in these two week chunks. So the next step was that I I talked to the manager of the team, and first I asked them. Like, what benefit do you think the team is getting from these meetings? So what benefit is there for the operations and the development part uh, of the team being there together, working together in the Scrum? And the answer was that we decided to make this change because of transparency. So we want... We want the work to be transparent to the whole team. We want the operations people to be aware of what development is working on and and vice versa. So I I thought that was interesting because obviously transparency is is one of the key key values in agile, but it was clear to me that it it, it wasn't really working in this case because 
Of course, there were some dependencies. So sometimes the operations people, they would have some kind of a development task or where they needed to collaborate with development. But most often, this was not the case. So so, so how, how, did you then, how did you then tackle that? Because obviously the transparency was, uh, let's say, a requirement for whatever would be coming next. So how, how did you tackle that? Right. So I was a bit, I was a bit lost uh, with that feedback myself. And actually, then I went to speak with my mentor, who is someone that I worked with, who is a, who is a more senior, senior scrum master. Um, and I asked him what, like, they, they have this value that is a good value, but I feel like it's, it's really not working in this case. Like, what, what would you do in this situation? Or what is your view uh, on transparency in this kind of a context? And, and he said to me that, you know, all good things are only good if they are in moderation. So too much of anything uh, can be bad and that starts to create waste and I thought yes that's that that's exactly it like that's um the kind of so you had your zen master moment just, uh, with your mentor there <laughs> exactly it was such a simple piece of uh piece of uh, advice in a way but it clarified the whole situation for me so after that I went back to speak with the manager and I told him that I I did a survey. I asked the team some questions, um, and this is what they said. And they actually have a solution on how to solve this problem. Um, and that that solution is to for the operations people to go back onto their own own way of working, and to mitigate this transparency issue is. Maybe maybe they can still join the sprint reviews. And if any sprint, there are some dependencies or there are some tasks that they would need to uh, work with the development team, then they'll do it. But, but in general, they will work separately. They will not have to join the scrum meetings anymore. But of course, for them to know what the development team is working on. And likewise, if they want to give some kind of an update on their work, they are more than welcome to join the sprint review. So th this is a great story because it's a, a story about change, but from a different angle from what we usually take it, right? Usually when we talk about change, we talk about the change that we want to bring to the team. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this was a story about a change that the, the team, or at least part of the team, wanted to bring about themselves. And it puts us as, as uh, change agents in a very interesting position because our role is to find out what is it that the team already wants to do and is ready to do, right? And, and you did the survey, you eventually talked to the manager, found out their perspective, because in this context, they are part of the change, obviously, since they are a cr critical stakeholder. And, and then you ended up promoting a solution that, as you said, the team already knew they wanted, right? I mean, Obviously, we need to bring our perspective and, and maybe kind of, you know, put some moderation in it because you can always go too much into the other side as well. But, but it's a very right. interesting position where you as a, as a change agent are there to bring about the change that already is wanting to come out, but it's perhaps limited by, you know, the, the mandate of the manager, for example. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I obviously, when I was uh, in the beginning, when I was observing the meetings and how the team was working. That was that was my idea as well, that operations work should be absolutely separated from the development work. But then again, it's not, um, that could just be my idea or my view of the situation. So I thought it would be, it would be crucial for it to be the team's own initiative and the team's own idea and not just me as a new person coming into the team saying, Oh, like this has to, this has to change. Uh, so that's why I thought the end result was, was really amazing because the team knew exactly what they needed. And, and also what I added um, when I was talking to the manager, I said, if you notice at some point that there is suddenly this lack of transparency and that it is a problem, 
then we can inspect the situation and maybe make some kind of an adjustment. So it was essentially like, okay, the team wants to do this. Let's do it and see how it goes. If we Absolutely. have, if if no if no issues arise, then we know that it was the it was the right thing to do, and the team the team did change, and everything improved actually both for development and for them. So the scrum meetings became a lot shorter. Whoever was there was actively actively participating and attending. So actually, the audience was finally the right audience. And, um, and now more than a year ago, so this happened more than a year ago. And just recently I checked with the operations team, how everything was going for them, how they were doing. And they said that they're really happy working the way, working the way that they are working and they have had no problems. And also there has been no issue with the lack of transparency. So I think this was just a case of having something good, but it was a little bit too much of it. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it as your mentor did. So thank you for sharing that story, Kaisa. Thanks, Vasco. Leading change is one of the core skills we must acquire, but it is only one of the steps towards our success as Scrum Masters. Tomorrow, on Success Thursday, we will talk about how to define success for the Scrum Master role. We'll cover tips on how to measure your way to that position and most importantly how to develop that focus on continuous improvement that is as important for scrum masters as it is for teams see you tomorrow we really hope you liked our show and if you did why not rate this podcast on stitcher or itunes share this podcast and let other scrum masters know about this valuable resource for their work remember that sharing is caring